We're live. Well, hello, everybody, um, and welcome to uh, StoryForge Live. These are our StoryForge office hours that we host uh, live twice a week. Uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, I'm Haley Boning, co-founder of StoryForge. I'm here with my co-founder, uh, Barry Chandler, uh, who's joining us from the West Coast. And we are going to be here uh, for the next uh, amount of time to answer your questions. Um, so this live stream uh, is something that we've been doing uh, for the last couple of weeks in response to um, questions that we're receiving from our clients, from colleagues, from people in the community. Um, we at StoryForge have spent the last six years or so um, helping businesses uh, get the clarity that they need uh, to be more meaningful, to connect with their customers and their employees, um, and be more impactful, um, irrespective of the economy or their competition. So we're finding that a lot of the conversations that we have in our regular office hours are useful and valuable to all of you out there in the stratosphere. So we're happy to, uh, to have our conversations live with you. Um, look, here's something we know. We know the world has changed. It's changed dramatically for all of us in the last six weeks. Um, and because the world has changed, so do we need to change as businesses um, and as business leaders. Uh, expectations are just different than they were six, six weeks ago. Expectations of our customers and our employees. Um, so we need different approaches. Um, and that's a lot of the conversations we've been having over the last several weeks with clients and customers and colleagues is how to make those changes, how to do things differently than we have before. Um, businesses today, we know need to be out there. We need to be sharing, we need to be showing, we need to be proving why we're relevant, why we're meaningful to the people we serve. Um, and just having something to sell is no longer a meaningful enough story. So today we're gonna share some examples of businesses that are proving their relevance um, and that have proven their relevance in good times and in bad. We're gonna share some stories, uh, perhaps without naming any names, of businesses that we see out there not doing a fantastic job and why we think that's the case. Um, and then we're gonna take your questions. So we'll share our insights, we'll answer your questions at any time during this live stream. You can put your questions into that chat box that you see um, either on uh, Facebook or on YouTube, um, and we'll answer your questions live. You can also email us um, at any time during this live stream at purpose at storyforge.co. You can also send us an email to purpose at storyforge.co at any point during the week, um, and we'll collect your questions and we'll answer them during office hours. Um, so uh, Barry, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, how this works? Um, both in this live stream and, and for the rest of the week, and then talk a little bit about our topics we thought we'd cover today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's great to, to do these, and it's great to connect with businesses who are, <clears throat> excuse me, who are uh, finding themselves in new and unique circumstances. So every Wednesday and Friday, we meet here virtually on Facebook and YouTube at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And our goal is to help businesses find the answers they need in these uncertain times. We know that businesses are struggling to find answers to questions they never had asked of them before. Uh, they are faced with new decisions, uh, new choices, uh, hopefully new opportunities, but there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of confusion, and there's a lot of chaos in the marketplace. So in order to cut through all of that, in order to make the best decisions, we're here every Wednesday and Friday to help answer questions about how to ensure that you, your team, uh, are aligned on the same page, moving in the same direction towards the same goals, knowing that um, you have a vision that is still burning strong, hopefully inside your heart that you're trying to achieve. And so we need a plan. Businesses need a, 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 an approach and a process and a plan on how they're going to achieve their goals, knowing that everything has shifted for them. So every Wednesday and Friday, we'll do this. And as Haley mentioned, we'll take questions. If anybody's got any questions anytime, uh, we'll certainly answer those live. But we wanted to talk this morning about decision making. And it's on a, on a daily basis, we're having conversations with our clients and we're understanding the challenges that they're facing. And we're uh, learning what is new to them that uh, wasn't there a month ago or six weeks ago. And we know that making decisions, the right decisions today will be the difference between how well that business is going to do in the next few weeks, next few months, or in the longer term. So we wanted to talk about how to make those, how to make the best decisions for your business and what to consider when we're making those decisions. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Uh, we've 
in some of these conversations with other leaders in the last couple of weeks, um, one leader mentioned uh, that he felt like his crystal ball had been shattered, had, had dropped to the floor and shattered at the beginning of all of this. The ways that, that he and his business had been making decisions were just no longer relevant. Um, I also, I picked up a copy uh, or rather read my online copy of a magazine that I follow called Columbus CEO. And the editor in chief there, Katie uh, Smith, mentioned that she was in her editor's office at her editor's desk um, the other day, just clearing things out because she really hadn't been in there for the last six weeks. And sitting very prominently on her desk was an economic report for the region that had just been published the week before all of this hit. And she looked at it um, slightly wistfully. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure as she was clearing her desk, it went straight into the bin. Uh, because the way that we had predicted things uh, six or eight weeks ago in the business, looking at trends, looking at data, looking at what happened last year, um, is just not relevant anymore. Um, so the ways that we've made decisions, the ways we've traditionally made decisions in our business, looking at what worked before and what happened before as a way to predict what works now um, is just not relevant anymore. Um, so we need a new way of thinking about things. We need a new framework for decision making. So if we rely on the same frameworks that we used before, we're going to make bad decisions. We're going to make poor decisions. And Barry, you, you were telling me yesterday about one uh, particular decision that a business made. Um, this is one example of many that we're seeing in the press, but uh, maybe you could talk about that decision that they made, potentially a decision that they might have made a year ago or two years ago, and it would not have been an issue, but they were using the same decision-making filter that they had in the past and it went horribly wrong. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there's a large, let's just call them a large steak restaurant chain that recently received a large amount of uh, PPP funding from the Small Business Association uh, as many as hundreds and thousands of, of businesses have received this and, and many more are hoping to. And uh, this company faced a, an immediate backlash from their customers for announcing and celebrating the fact that they had received this money. Now, one of the criteria for, for receiving this money is that you have to use it to pay your employees within two, within the, over the next few months. And so there's no doubt that this money was being used to pay their employees, but the backlash was not that their employees was going, or were going to be paid, but rather that two things. One, this was a company that is cash rich, that is uh, publicly traded, that has uh, access to large amounts of capital. And there are customers of that very same restaurant chain who themselves are business owners who cannot get access to capital, cannot get access to these funds. And their question, rightfully so, was how does a big business like this that doesn't need the money get access to this when we ourselves can't get access to this funding? And it created an online furore, an online backlash. And what was interesting to me was watching how they responded and how others connected to the business responded. They stood firm and defended their decision. And then on Twitter, uh, a grandson of the original founder of this of this restaurant chain created a long thread uh, bemoaning the uh, their decision and complaining about uh, how they made that decision and tying the decision back to uh, how at odds it was with the founding principles of that business 60 or 70 years ago and how they had made decisions 60 or 70 years ago when times were tough and when people needed uh, needed help this steak restaurant chain 60 years ago had stepped up and had fed hundreds and thousands of people uh, and had cleared out all of their kitchens across their chain to make sure that people were fed and they put people outside their business first they put their employees first and he was sharing how he felt this was completely at odds with the decision that was made today which was executive saying we'll take this money uh, even though we have plenty of cash we're not going to do anything extra for the public or anything extra for our employees beyond what is just expected of us. And that was it. And it showed, and, and this, this, this Twitter conversation got massive engagement because it showed very clearly the stark differences between the beliefs and the values that had made that chain maybe so beloved by its employees historically, by customers historically, and the decision they'd made today which was clearly financially driven, not for the good of just their employees, but for the stock price, for the bottom line, and that created massive disconnect. So 
the the way they made that decision was to your point earlier use trying to use the same criteria for decision making today that they would have two months ago or six months ago before all of this happened which was you know we've got to strengthen our bottom line we've got to make sure that we're we, our stock price our share price is uh is growing all of the time whereas today those same criteria for decision making cannot are in many cases not acceptable by the public, not acceptable by employees. And we're seeing more and more examples of businesses facing a backlash for making tone deaf decisions, wow. not fully understanding the needs of those that are in their ecosystem and those stakeholders that they serve. So this was one particularly glaring example, I think, of not having the correct filter for decision making in place in order to make the decision that would best serve all of the stakeholders and we're seeing cost to them now of people saying they will never dine there again they'll take their business elsewhere you cannot use any kinds of public relations to uh to re to recover from yeah. that bad decision which yeah. could have been made in a much better way yeah it's what's interesting to me is and maybe running with this analogy of tone deaf that there are businesses out there who have who have received those ppp loans and have invested back in their employees and paying people for eight weeks who aren't receiving the same backlash, um, who, haven't, who haven't been called out by their stakeholders, their customers and their communities for doing something that feels tone deaf. So I'm curious, what are the, what are the things that businesses can do to make sure that they're making decisions that are more harmonious and less dissonant, that don't land with a thud um, when it comes to their stakeholders? What, what are some of those things that businesses can do? The word authenticity comes to mind because the, we're seeing many examples of businesses who are coming out with very uh, moody, evocative, emotional advertising right now, talking about how they've been here for 60 years, taking care of their people, and now it's time to take care even more. And um, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day, and, and they had that same same question, which was, well, why do we not why are we reacting so viscerally to some of these ads uh, and why are we just tut tutting when we see them and the reason is because there are companies who are spending a lot of money putting out ads to make them look incredibly mm -hmm. service oriented and uh, part of the community when the reality for those customers who have been with them for a while or who have who have had experiences with them may be very different. And so there's a massive disconnect. Uh, so the, like, take an example without naming any of them, but there's only a few of them, these large telecommunication companies who talk about the care that they take at every step to take care of their people, their communities. And I know if we asked 10 of their customers, uh, is that the same experience you get when you call them or when you're waiting for service for your for your internet or for your your, your TV? Is that what you feel? And there's a massive disconnect. So there's an authenticity gap, I think, uh, that's that's obvious there. Like this large steak restaurant, many of their customers understood the values upon which they were founded, the family orientation, the 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 welcoming openness, and they saw this decision as being completely at odds with it. So the the, the tone deafness to me is as a result of not understanding what it is that we're valued for and what it is that people think or understand we're about. And it comes back to things like our beliefs, our values, how we've carried ourselves and demonstrated through our actions over the years who we really are. Because if, if we put out an ad or we make a decision today that's at odds with how we've behaved, how we've lived and who we've been for many years, it's no surprise or it shouldn't be any surprise when somebody raises their hand and says, nope, I don't agree with that. That's absolutely wrong. And so I think at at best it creates a disconnect, but at worst, at worst, it, it I think it creates a massive chasm between the needs of those we're serving and the needs of the business. Yeah, there's something interesting about the way we as humans uh, approach or perceive brands. Um, when a business is just a business, we perceive it one way. But when a business becomes a brand and starts to develop a personality, we actually, and it's scientifically proven, we begin to see and treat that business like a person. Right. We expect it to operate like a person with values and with beliefs. And so when businesses do things that seem dissonant, um, it kind of taps into that very human uh, reaction 
to someone saying one thing and doing another. Right. Uh, and just about every culture in the world has some way of talking about this, speaking out of both sides of your mouth, uh, the right hand and left hand doing different things. It's a very human uh, reaction um, to feel um, a lack of trust when we see uh, two things happening simultaneously in one person and then being dissonant. So it's interesting that businesses, the, the one thing businesses are trying to do, which is to be seen as a human being to be seen as a living, breathing um, organism with beliefs and values that it's putting into practice is the one thing that actually leaves us open to um, to criticism if we do it incorrectly. Um, I was thinking about a uh, a conversation that I had with a, with another business um, business consultant, somebody who works with some of our larger um, larger businesses in the in the country. And she was saying that uh, one of her clients, her colleagues, had had uh, uh, received one of these large PPE loans um, and was considering the ability to bring his team back now with this loan. But he was very worried. And he said, you know, how do I bring my team back when I don't know what's going to happen next? Right. Now, I know I can make this decision, but I don't know what's going to happen in eight weeks or 12 weeks and, and what's going to happen with the business. So how can I how can I do this? How can I communicate to them in this time? And it struck me that uh, that beliefs were one of the things that we can hold on to. It's right. one of the things that we can be sure about. There's a lot that we can't be sure about. There's a lot that's still uncertain. Um, but especially when we're talking with our teams and we're thinking about our own leadership communication, that, that one piece that that steak restaurant let uh, fall by the wayside was actually one of the things that they could have held on to, which is to say, this is our, our legacy, this is our tradition, these are our beliefs, and these are our values, and we don't know what's going to happen next, but we know that we're going to use these beliefs and these values as part of our filter for thinking and, yeah. and what's going to inform our decision-making in the future. So, so that you know, filter for thinking it, like that, that, that they use there was solely financial. Mm -hmm. And if if the if the implications of financial decision making are all we want to worry about, well, then they 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 got the financial implication of of making that decision, which was uh, the audience coming coming to the fore saying, "Nope, that doesn't work for us. We see what you did there. It was purely a financial decision." Yeah. So we would always make the argument that the financial decision is only one piece, and it is one of many different questions to answer about the business and if we only answer one question about our business then we shouldn't be surprised that by ignoring all other areas we've created a disconnect or we've created a massive gap that ends up not meeting the needs of all of our customers or all of our employees or all of our people but also perhaps not even our bottom line which was the thing we were trying to meet in the first place yeah it's <clears throat> it's interesting this filter it's a different filter for every company, isn't it? There's not just one way of making decisions. How do you, how do, how do companies um, and businesses and leaders think about creating this filter? What is the, what does the filter come from itself? So if we think about a filter and we talk about this filter for thinking a lot, a filter removes impurities in any, in any, anything we, we use a filter for, we're trying to uh, ensure that what comes out the other side of the filter is the bit that we want. And in a business, we are faced with decisions at every level, every single day, in every area, from marketing to sales to hiring, decisions at a senior level, all the way down to the intern. Everyone's making decisions. How are they all making decisions? Uh, and are they all making decisions in the same way? And we would always uh, be huge proponents of having the same filter for thinking about all of those decisions so that everybody in the organization understands how to make decisions, why they're making decisions that way, so that everybody is moving in the same way towards the same goals. Every business, to your point, Haley, does have a different filter for thinking because every single business is different and every business has different beliefs and values and motivators and vision and purpose and skills and best at. And so the filter must be unique to your business but it must help you move towards your goals in a way that matters to you and your team and your customers and how you've, who you've determined must matter in your, in your equation. So the filter does change from business to business, but we've, we've seen over the years the benefits of having a filter for thinking in place 
and the downside of not having a filter in place at all. And we were discussing this yesterday. We, we talked about how people with no filter are generally not regarded very well because they're seen to just blurt things out and they can often insult people and they can do damage because they have no filter. And we tend to like people who think before they speak and who uh, have a care and consideration before they make decisions because we know that they've taken into consideration more feelings and perhaps just their own. No different for a business. There is a way of thinking and a way of behaving that is unique to that set of circumstances in an organization. And we've seen the greatest companies who've generated the greatest results for not just their bottom line, but for their people, all make decisions the same way. And in many cases, team members are empowered to make decisions, are given some, in, in some cases, I know um, team members are given a budget to make decisions uh, in line with that filter for thinking because the business is so clear and their their team is so is so understanding and empowered towards this this goal and, and and understanding the behaviors so it is different for everybody and how you get there is by answering essential questions about your business we are all so close to our business every day it can be tough to extract ourselves back or to transcend the business and look down on top of it and and answer questions about our business but if we haven't answered these essential questions about our business, we can't develop this filter for thinking that's going to allow everybody make decisions the same way. So it's about answering a set of essential questions that gives us the insight and gives us the filter for thinking so that what comes out the other side is clarity that helps us decide how to speak, how not to speak, how to make decisions, how to hire, how to fire, how to grow, how to scale back. All of those things come from that filter for thinking, don't they? I do. It's it's interesting. There are a lot of the decisions, uh, decisions, a lot of the uh, question ways that we've made those decisions dispensed with. So we can't look at data. We can't look at what we did before. We can't look at trends. Um, and now we know that looking at what other companies are doing um, might uh, you know inspire us in some way, but we can't make decisions like someone else. We just can't wear someone else's suit. We have to make our own decisions. Um, it's a, a slight terrifying place uh, for leaders to be right now. It feels confusing. It feels like they're making decisions in, in the midst of a lot of chaos. And what they tell us they really need is clarity. What I keep hearing over and over again is, I just, it's not clear to me. How do I make these decisions? It's not clear. Should I choose A or B, C or D? Um, and in some cases, they feel like they're guessing. Um, and uh, it, at right now, it would be very, um, I think, uh, understandable for a leader to say, well, nobody has clarity. We can't get to clarity, that nothing can be clear. Um, so yeah. what would you say to, to people saying, oh, it's impossible to have any kind of clarity right now. Everything's uncertain. We should just be shooting from the hip. Well, we, we've always known how complex businesses are and how as they grow and scale, and mature they become more and more complex and maybe the layers between the ceo and the founder and the newest employee uh, become greater and greater and greater and now you layer in on top of this a global pandemic and it must you know it does seem even more complex and even more chaotic and there are more things to consider but imagine you could take all of the information all of the questions all of the thoughts all of the quandaries that business leaders are facing and put them all into a giant a giant tub that we were able to then use a very simple filter to understand what comes out the other side and what doesn't and what we use to how we would evaluate all of those things really simply like we look at a filter for thinking as being one page for a complex business that is thousands could have thousands of employees there is one simple one page that is the filter for thinking about everything that a business does that clar the clarity that comes from having that, despite all the chaos, despite the new marketplace, despite the new challenges that we're facing, the ability to come back to something simple, the ability to come back to a one pager that helps a business make those decisions, I think has never been more essential. We've, I'll never forget, working with one business a couple of years ago where the founder, we, we, I was due to meet the founder for, for a meeting halfway through our project. And he came late to the meeting and he was furious. He was fuming because he had just come from uh, one of his departments where a one of his employees had made a decision uh, about customer service, had basically told a customer that 
in no uncertain terms, they couldn't help them. And they told them in a, in a way that, that really offended the customer. They didn't take care of the customer. And the, the CEO was absolutely fuming at how that person had handled that customer service interaction. And he said, don't they understand how, the, how we would never treat a customer that way? And I said, okay, let's just stop there and dive into that. Don't they understand? Have you ever explained how we make decisions about customer service? Have we ever codified or articulated our way of serving the customer so that everybody, whether they're here 20 years or, or 20 minutes, understands that this is our way? And he said, well, no, they should just get it. Mm -hmm. And they should just get it is a great example of how we can often be lost in the growth of the business and the fighting of the fires and assuming that everybody in the organization is making decisions the same way we are. And so we as founders are busy trying to set the vision and trying to organize strategies and roll out uh, initiatives and campaigns. And uh, we're assuming that that greater vision alone will be enough, not realizing that everybody else in the organization may not be making decisions the same way or understanding how we're supposed to do it or how, and, and yeah. don't get it. So we're trying to bring the complexity, we're trying to bring the variables to a very simple filter for thinking. And this one page that we would, we would call this one page for, one page is a decision-making tool, one page is a, is a tool to understand what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do. Uh, and that is a remarkably freeing and liberating experience for a founder to have this and to be able to point, come back to this one thing when faced with any decision in their business. So I think that is the thing that it's becoming obvious now in the press and the news every day, who has this and who doesn't, who is using a filter for thinking uh, that has taken into consideration not just their financial bottom line, but the needs of those that they serve, the vision that they have for the world, their purpose as an organization, so that everything externally and internally seems aligned when they make decisions or when they share messaging. Yeah, there's an interesting point, I think in every um, entrepreneurial ventures um, growth, where they've scaled to a point where that first team, that initial team that had been working together since the beginning, um, is now surrounded by 20, 30, 40, 50, sometimes 100 other people. And there's a moment, and I, I, we should be able to name this moment, um, when it all starts to break down uh, because it hasn't been written down. It's not been codified in black and white on a piece of paper for everyone in the business, whether they've been there five minutes or they've been there since the very first, um, first day of the business, um, for everyone to use. Um, because there's these wonderful early years where the founding team works together so closely that they finish each other's sentences. Um, they've been there for all of the massive failures that have created the insights um, because so that leadership will never make that mistake again. Uh, you know, they've been there when um, when grandma decided that um, all the food was going to go bad in the in the freezer. And so let's just cook it all and and, and feed people. Um, because that's the right thing to do. And they have that memory in the back of their head, those origin stories. So that founding team, it can feel like you just got the best people in the world working together. And yeah, maybe you do. But when we they start adding new people, what we often hear from the CEO is, well, that guy didn't get it. You know, he's just not good enough. He's not talented enough. She didn't understand. She didn't get who we were. Um, and almost often it is not that person's fault. It's just not. They've been dropped into a business where all of this is in the in the founder and the CEO's head and the few people that have been working with her since the beginning all get it because they've been around for the lessons. Yeah, um, yep. It's virtually impossible for a business to scale, impossible for a business to grow until they can extract that from that founding team and get it down on paper and use it as a filter for, for decision making and a filter for thinking for that larger team. Th those two small little letters in the word it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, how could two small letters in one tiny word cause such disconnect and dissonance in an organization? Well, what's it? And it is often clear to the founder. It is often clear to the leader, but it is not always translated or uh, articulated in such a way that everybody in the organization, irrespective of their tenure can get it. And so, when we're talking about a filter for thinking, 
we're talking about using a set of we're talking about answering a number of essential questions about the business that allow it to be articulated and then yeah. it becomes the filter for thinking about everything that we do yeah and we have a, we have an interesting question uh, from our live stream here from Catherine lane klein um, who asks if you have always had a caring message to clients how does it stay heard now that every company has become i'm going to use air quotes caring um, in their messages so that is a great question Catherine. and i think there, there are two things that come to mind for me and then i'll i'll send it over to barry the first is that um, stories really meaningful stories that businesses tell are both told and also lived and i think that's an important distinction so yes, there are a lot of businesses and we've all seen the and made fun of the ads that have come out recently of everyone showing how caring they are um, through their ads and through their messages. The good news is um, most of us have pretty highly tuned sophisticated BS filters um, as both employees and as customers. Um, and we can see through that. And one of the first ways we see through that is to look at what a company does as well as what a company says. Um, and so that's one of the things as a, as a company, um, and yours certainly is, is one of those, Catherine, that has always had a caring message. Um, it's not just the message that's been caring, but it's the decisions that you've made as a business because that sense of caring has, is baked into the filter for thinking and decision making that you and your team uses on a daily basis to make all of those little micro decisions that actually all over time uh, when you look at them in concert with each other, have created a caring brand. Um, and it's what your customers and your employees expect from you. So I think that's one thing is having a caring message is also about using that, that notion of caring to make decisions in your business. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I also think how we express that caring um, in our messaging and positioning has to also be put through that filter. Um, so it's going to look different for every business. One of the things that I think we all are highly attuned to is uh, when every business is talking about the way they care in exactly the same way, um, it loses both its um, authenticity, but also its punch and its meaning. So we're all going to care in a different way that's more authentic to who we are and to the DNA of our business. Um, Barry, do you, do you have anything you'd want to add there? I think those are two great points. And, and Catherine, we know your business has been has been caring before caring became cool in messaging and marketing and you've taken care of people for a long time what i'm seeing bubbling to the top now positively when i'm hearing about new companies are things that they're doing so to Haley's point about living that message it's 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 how they're using that belief about care not to market and say well we've always cared for you and we're here for you and we're all in this together no 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 we know not everyone's in this together and we know most most businesses sadly are about the bottom line what i'm seeing bubbling to the top now are businesses that are genuinely acting upon the beliefs with no expectation of return financially immediately from that but rather saying look we've always been about this what is the most we can possibly do now while keeping the lights on in order to prove that or not just prove it but but in order to help those who have new needs in order to demonstrate to our stakeholders that that's what we're about. We're making tough decisions, and maybe sometimes that's at our cost, but we'll do that right now because others have a greater need. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm very anti-marketing messages right now, and I'm very pro-meaning and demonstrating selflessly what we're doing that is aligned with who we've always been. And... Um, if, if everybody says we're in this together, yet everyone is still struggling, that tells me that not everybody's thinking about fixing the problems or addressing the challenges that we all have collectively. Um, but I, I'd love to see more businesses trying to figure out what they can do now that the, now that the needs have shifted. And we had, a, we had a question on one of our previous streams, Haley, and the question was posed about, well, how do I get uh, more people to share my message? now uh, and, and our response immediately was that's not that's the wrong question the question is not how we get our message shared the question is what can we do now more than we've ever done before using our skills and our beliefs to change the realities the the unfortunate realities for so many of the people that we serve i think that's how we're going to get heard as business leaders and and, and organizations today 
Yeah. And we've, we've always preached that, haven't we? From the, from, to anyone who listen and to those that won't, yeah. we've shouted about stop marketing, start meaning, start yeah. mattering. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think one of the, you mentioned earlier, Barry, that there are these um, essential questions, these fundamental questions that we need to ask of ourselves as businesses so that we can create this unique and authentic filter for thinking for our own business, this filter for decision making. And, and this is maybe one of those, um, one of those important questions uh, that speaks to Catherine's question uh, as well is to think about who you serve as a business. So who are your stakeholders? And what do they need and what do they want? Um, and if you've asked and answered these questions a year ago, you should do it again right now. <laughs> and hopefully you have attained a level of um, intimacy with your customers, with your employees, with your community, with your partners and your vendors and suppliers, that you can probably guess how their needs have changed in the last six to eight weeks. But it would be a very fruitful exercise to go back and revisit that. Um, not just uh, in your own thinking, but also reaching out to all of those people in your community and finding out what their needs are and how can you find opportunities for win-win-win situations where, where multiple stakeholders of yours are being served, um, including your employees, including your bottom line, including your business, um, but solving those needs through your unique skill set and the unique ways that you can um, approach the problems in the world that you were trying to solve eight weeks ago and you're still trying to solve today. Um, so that's finding those insights um, and then acting on those insights um, with caring and with love um, and with attention to the needs of all of your stakeholders will do so much more for your business than putting together a marketing campaign. I think there's there, there's a an important realization that many businesses are having, which is those returns perhaps that we had financially over the past, be it quarter or year or two years or 10 years, those, so that, that expectation of return is maybe different now, that the returns may be diminished for now. So knowing that we may not get the same returns and the decisions we make will not get us those returns immediately, what can we still do to take care of those that we serve based on our principles and our beliefs? Um, and if we look around us, bars, restaurants, uh, service industry and the hospitality industry is is that is is practically shut down is for all intents and purposes shut down but i think of i was i was observing the actions of one of the world's largest drinks companies uh, that that turns over billions of dollars a year and their their route to market through bars and restaurants is is shut down now they can't sell their spirits through bars and restaurants and i've been watching and observing their messaging over the past few few, few weeks and none of their messaging at all has been about selling more spirits or having consumers uh, order online or directing them to retailers to buy their spirits. Instead, they've mobilized their entire street teams and on the ground people to uh, serve meals and buy meals for bartenders and servers and restaurants. So every day in cities around the world, their street teams go to restaurants that are serving and they will pay with their company credit card for meals for bartenders and servers. And their hope is that they can meet the needs and they can take care of those people who have served perhaps the drinks of that company for so many years. And they know that, look, we can't make money right now, but what we can do is take care of the people who've taken care of us. And so they're spending money knowing that, of course, in time it'll come back and the, the, the loyalty that's built in from this will return. But it's acknowledging that there is no immediate return to the cash flow that they had two months ago. But instead, what can we do to meet the needs of those who need us and who we need uh, moving forward? And so I think it's there has to be an element of selflessness in, in, in approaching this, knowing that it's not solely about the bottom line, that there's the, the longer term return is going to come from trying to raise that rise that tide for all the boats, not just your own. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm also interested in, I'd be interested as well if, if folks are listening to share stories that you've heard of businesses who have found opportunities to, to, to do that selfless work, but also uh, companies that have found ways to, to, to find those win-win situations where multiple stakeholders are being served simultaneously. Um, while it's not a, uh, a for-profit business, um, there's a, a group here in, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, where I'm based, that has started a group called uh, Curbside Concerts. 
So recognizing that there were two stakeholder groups that they had that were had a specific need related to COVID. So one was um, all of our elderly um, population and folks who have uh, significant medical issues who really have to isolate at home and completely quarantine themselves and worried especially about our, our elderly citizens uh, for whom that kind of isolation can be actually really damaging both mentally and physically. Um, the second group that they were concerned with were our musicians. So lots of working musicians also in the hospitality industry in many cases are out of work, not able to do gigs, not able to make money either through their day jobs or through their night jobs as musicians. Um, and we were looking, they were looking for ways to, to put those musicians to work. So Curbside Concerts is a program that pays musicians um, to stand in the back of a flatbed truck and drive around to, um, uh, to visit with uh, people who cannot leave their house uh, as a result of these stay at home orders and have to quarantine um, to share music, to do a gig uh, in a neighborhood. Uh, and it's really wonderful to see and it's wonderful for me because it serves two needs. It's a great example of putting musicians to work but also meeting the need of another stakeholder group in the community um, that was isolated and, and needed to have some joy and some connection with other people in their life. So finding those as businesses, you know, maybe using that as an example and looking for those opportunities where we can meet multiple needs. Can you meet the needs of your employees by applying for that PPP loan, getting it and putting people back to work? And then if they can't in that moment, um, work in the way they traditionally have, could you find other opportunities for them to be put to work, serving some of your other stakeholders and meeting their needs? Um, and to Barry's point, that will come back to you in time. This coronavirus and, and, the, and the impact it's had and the world it has created has laid bare for all to see the uh, the approaches that many businesses have that in no way are focused on meeting the needs of people beyond just serving the bottom line and the the decisions that we see some businesses making and the communications and the um the demands to return perhaps to work even when it's not for some employees safe to do so are showing where the care truly lies and what is truly important so we've we are having this is a moment where we're getting a chance to show who we really are and to, it, we've often talked about how if we if we first figure out what it is everyone in our ecosystem needs and then we figure out how to meet those needs we make the argument that we'll be rewarded financially as a result but when we flip that and we say we need to make money now what are the ways we can make money then we make very different decisions and we're seeing that now very clearly, and we're going to see more of this. We're going to see businesses that lose customers because of their perceived priority of profitability. And I don't think either of us would argue that profitability is not absolutely essential because we can't fulfill a big purpose without it. But it's surely not the only goal of a business just to make money. And if that is all that is being communicated through actions and through messaging, then we shouldn't be surprised when some businesses don't make it because customers have determined that's no longer important to me. We've now realized that there is there are bigger things that matter. There are, there are more important things in the world. And businesses who have always flipped that and first figured out the needs of those that are in their communities or in their ecosystem and then how to intersect their services and their skills with those to, to, to meet their needs. Those businesses, I think, will not just thrive in the medium term, but they will thrive in the long term. Because I don't think we've ever sought more meaning than right now. We're isolated. We're away from people. We need people. We need community. And we need to know that the businesses that we spend money with care about the same things that we do. So it's a real... It's a laying bare of, of, of how businesses think right now. And I think we should all pay attention to, to who who we want to do business with going forward. And all of our customers are doing the same thing, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yeah. So just a reminder to folks, um, throughout our live streams uh, and also throughout the week, you can email us uh, at purpose at storyforge.co 
uh, purpose at storyforge.co. Let us know your questions. Let us know what you're hearing. Um, share stories of businesses you think are doing things right and stories of businesses you wish were doing things differently. Um, we'd love to get your questions. You can also at any time pop a comment or a question uh, or an insult or a complaint uh, into the live stream uh, chat and we'd be happy to address them uh, or contradict them uh, in turn. So uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us today. We'll be here every Wednesday, every Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. We are going to share more examples of businesses that are finding ways to connect, to be meaningful, to matter, and to uh, have uh, the ability to make the best decisions for themselves, for their business, and for their people, and, and how you can perhaps replicate some of those approaches as well. So uh, we look forward to seeing you here on Friday again at 11 a.m. Eastern. And until then, stay safe and stay at home where possible. Yes.